The Soviet Union now dominated the nations along its western border. At first, Stalin did not impose a Soviet system on his new empire. Instead, he built up pro-Soviet coalition governments, but the communists made sure that the police and security were in their hands. The Yalta Conference had given Russia control of Central Europe. We knew perfectly well what the Russians interpreted as democracy and all that, but, but then we were allies fighting a war together. We couldn't very well say to Stalin, now we are going to write down our interpretation of Western democracy and you've got to sign up and say this is your interpretation. But it wasn't possible. We began to receive cables from American representatives in the what we were all later to call the satellite countries on the behavior of Soviet troops with respect to uh, uh, the people of Poland, uh, of Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, and so on. So uh, trouble was in the air. What would happen is that such and such a prominent member of the peasant party of Bulgaria would be kidnapped, simply would disappear. Uh, or other figures who were not acceptable for inclusion in the People's Democratic uh, new regimes uh, would be disappeared. In Berlin, where the Allies jointly supervised city life, the communists were careful. The idea was at the beginning to cooperate and gradually gradually to build up the party, making the best organized party, the most militant party, the most active party, and gradually increase the influence on the other parties and gradually take over the whole situation, but not at once. We should already prepare for building up the police the man for personnel, who changes personnel, the man for education. So we were flabbergasted. Uh, we only three or four comrades, and everybody else are social democrats and bourgeois democrats and so on. Uh, so one of us asked and said, it, it must look democratic, but we must have everything in our hands. Many Germans perfectly well understood that brown, the Nazi colors, were becoming red overnight. After all, the methods in some ways were the same, or at any rate very similar, of forcing people to do things against their will. For me, my only comparison was always the Soviet Union under Stalin. And comparable to the Soviet Union under Stalin, 1935 to 45. 45 to 46, 47 in Germany was uh, wonderful. It was much less terror than which I had witnessed the 10 years before in the Soviet Union. Poland. In the wreckage of Warsaw, the Poles began to clear the ruins. The Poles had fought the Germans on every front, east and west. Now they worked together to rebuild their country. Some loathed the new semi-communist government tied to Moscow, but others found reasons to accept it and live with it. The most important thing for me was for my mother and sister to come from Siberia and for us to begin rebuilding the country. We also needed to secure our borders, which were seriously threatened. Staying in the army gave me that chance. In Moscow, Poland's new puppet leaders were taken to the opera. The Poles agreed to a close alliance with the Soviet Union.
Stalin promised to defend the new Polish frontiers against any German attempt to win back the lost territories. Stalin was at the zenith of his power. His colleagues felt terror in his presence. Churchill was due to speak to a college audience at Fulton in Truman's home state. Privately, he showed Truman what he was going to say. The president, not sure that the American public was ready for an attack on its wartime Soviet ally, let Churchill test the water. Mr. Churchill, he's one of the great men of the age. He's a great Englishman. He's a great Englishman, but he's half American. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Except in the British Commonwealth and in the United States, where communism is in its infancy, the Communist Party's or fifth columns constitute a growing challenge and peril to Christian civilization. Whatever conclusions may be drawn from these facts, in fact they are, this is certainly not the liberated Europe we fought to build up, nor is it one which contains the essentials of permanent peace. In Prague, the Czechoslovaks discussed whether to join the Marshall Plan. In the democratically elected government, a third of the ministers were communists. The reactions were absolutely positive. Even the communist ministers in the government, in the Czechoslovak government, agreed with our participation in Paris. That means to attend the conference uh, to prepare the Marshall Plan. Uh, the uh, decision of the Czechoslovak government was uh, absolutely unanimous. Stalin summoned the Czech Prime Minister, Clement Gottwald, to Moscow. With him came the Foreign Minister, Jan Masaryk. They arrived on the afternoon of July 9th and waited. It was about 11 o'clock in the uh, evening, um, that means before midnight, uh, somebody came that they should immediately go over to Kremlin. But the principal uh, question put before them was that the Czechoslovak uh, delegation shouldn't go over to Paris to attend to the uh, conference on the Martian plot. Stalin said, if by 4 a.m. on the 11th of July you have not refused to attend, then be prepared. This will have serious consequences on our relations with you. Stalin was quite clear, quite rough, and he gave the ultimatum of four hours uh, to our delegation to uh, say their uh, decision. Uh, finally, the same government, which accepted unanimously the, accept, uh, the presence in Paris, rejected it. As far as the Marshall Plan is concerned, there was no uh, normal discussion. There was practically only a quite clear order. You have to do it, and if you do not do it, so you are not our friends. You are betraying uh, the Union, Soviet Union, and so on and so on. So this was quite clear. When the Czech delegation left Moscow, Gottwald read a prepared statement. He couldn't hide his discomfort. Jan Masaryk was shattered by the experience. When he came out from the plane, he said quite clearly, I was going to Moscow as a minister of a free state, and I am returning as Stalin's slave. 
In September 1947, 16 European nations signed up for the Marshall Plan and requested $20 billion of aid. The Western Alliance began to take shape. The battle lines of the Cold War were being drawn. The primary purpose uh, was compassionate, goodwill, the notion that our former allies uh, needed to have uh, the help of the United States. The policy of the Marshall Plan was seen in the Soviet Union as the Americans wanting to impose their influence over the countries to which they gave martial aid. The Soviet Union could not accept that, believing it to be an aggressive act on behalf of the Americans. That is why the Marshall Plan was never accepted in our country. That September 1947, Stalin revived the pre-war Communist International as the Cominform. Through it, Stalin planned to control the countries of the Eastern Bloc. He also instructed Communist parties in the West to take the initiative in seizing power. In American propaganda, the Cominform was represented as a sinister, shadowy conspiracy of evil. But its economic associate, Comicon, offered Russian aid to Eastern Bloc countries, sending grain to Czechoslovakia after a bad harvest. Both Cominform and Comicon were a direct response to the Marshall Plan. On the one hand, the common form would follow the political ideological line the Soviet Union wanted to adopt in the socialist countries. On the other hand, the aim of Comic-Con was to provide economic assistance in order to prevent these countries from being torn from our sphere of influence. February 1948, the communists reach for power in Czechoslovakia. Workers' militias go on the march. Non-communists are arrested. Action committees take over the police and the labor unions. President Benesh capitulates. The red flag flies in the center of Prague. In just five days, the communists took over Czechoslovakia's government. Stalin's rule was imposed on the Czechs. Two weeks later, Jan Masaryk fell to his death from the window of his apartment in Prague. The argument still rages. Did he despair and jump? Or was he pushed? Masaryk was the son of Thomas Masaryk, the founder of the Czech state. His funeral symbolized the end of a free Czechoslovakia. After the death of the minister, and there were really tens of thousands of people who were uh, coming to say farewell to the minister, the last farewell. They were uh, crying and flowers and so on and so on. But the general persuasion was that there was really the end. We felt it like that, unfortunately. The communist takeover in Prague shocked Washington. There, the case for martial aid was still being argued before a partly isolationist Congress. The Soviet Union and its agents have destroyed the independence and democratic character of a whole series of nations in Eastern and Central Europe. It is this ruthless course of action and the clear design to extend it to the remaining free nations of Europe that have brought about the critical situation in Europe today. It was touch and go when both houses of Congress were finally considering the legislation. Then the Czech coup occurred, and that was the final straw because even the isolationists, or most of them, could see that the Russians were advancing westward with the takeover in Czechoslovakia and so on. So it helped uh, very importantly to pass the legislation.